Magic 87.6, uh, Talk and Tech with our man Matthew Dickerson uh, on the air and in video. Again, uh, you can check it out on Matt's Facebook page, uh, Matthew Dickerson. Also, we'll put it up on our Facebook page as well, Magic 87.6 Mudgy. That's the one you can go and check out. And uh, Matt's uh, Airbus, they're putting some dogs out of work. No, not the puppies. They are. And actually, look, we're getting good feedback, Andrew, from the, the videos we're doing. Some people are telling me they really love the inside of your nose the view they're getting up the inside of your nose there so it's it's good <laughs> i touched it again when we started i gotta get out of this habit but, but people are telling me mudgy people are telling me that they're actually hearing some of the stuff and they're, they're watching the videos so that's that's great to see they're getting their technology fixed so it's fantastic so yeah oh, excellent <laughs> There All right, and I've got to, I've got to stop touching the nose thing, but I need to scratch my face right now, so I'm just getting it all in while we you uh, talk right. about uh, the puppy dogs. All right, let's get back to the dogs. As long as you're scratching the outside of the nose, not the inside of the nose. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. No, I'm not doing that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to so go. does that all mean right. you do it off camera, does it? <laughs> no, no, no comment. My wife bangs me out about it enough. <laughs> Yeah, but look, you are right, Airbus, we've got lots of people on unemployment queues at the moment, but Airbus is trying to put dogs in the unemployment queue. And it's been a long time since I've been on an international flight now because we've been locked down for yeah. so long. But back in the old days when we could fly internationally, I used to always look at the cute little puppies that were sniffing around people's bags. And to me, they were cute little puppies because I didn't have bombs or drugs mm. in my bags. But nah. I'm sure if you had some of that material, you might think they were so cute and, and, uh, and, and fluffy. But... Airbus has come up with this new concept with a, a, a biotech startup company that is basically trying to use a, a little bit of nature and a lot of technology to have a range of devices through airports that will actually smell bomb material and drugs in the air. And then the idea is, as you go through those devices, so that you might walk along, there might be an alarm that goes off at one, and back in their centralised recording office, they'll see an alarm go off at one, and there'll be a group of people near that one, but they'll wait until it triggers the second, the third, maybe even the fourth one as you go through the airport to narrow down, okay, there's that one person that's been at all those four. We reckon that's the person we need to go and have a, a bit of a chat to and, and maybe a bit of a look in, in their materials and their bag and see what they've got there. But the idea is to, to have the ability to use technology to sniff out some of these things, even have it on the actual planes themselves. People might manage to get onto the plane somehow and they've still got some of these materials on them, get that picked up. But now it's gone a step further and, and they've actually been able to test the bomb material for drugs. They haven't been able to do the third one yet, but with COVID-19 obviously affecting so many things around the world, the developers of this technology believe that they can actually use the same technology to smell someone that might have some particular ailment such as COVID-19. That's crazy. It is, absolutely. They're using kidney stem cells or, or brain cells to actually have as part of it. So there is a combination of nature in there as part of the technology in each device. So quite incredible technology in there. And they, they're talking about two airports actually having trials set up by the end of the year. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Poor puppy dogs are copping up from everywhere this week. They've already been put out of a job in Singapore. Have you seen the weird robotic ones that are going around? Uh, I think it's in Singapore where they're telling everyone to uh, keep social distancing. They are. They're out. It's Spot the Robot is actually over in Singapore. And, and Spot, you may remember Spot the Robot. He's famous uh, Boston Robotics. They've had a few robots they've built testing the concept out a few times. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, Spot is over in Singapore right now as we speak. There's a robot roaming a, a single park at the moment, just the one in Singapore. And, and the Singaporean government, which let's assume we can trust them for the moment, they're saying that they're not recording any individual material, they're not recording people's faces, they're not recording any IDs about those people, they're just recording the number of people in different areas in the park and they're telling people to maintain social distancing, do you need to be here, are you better off sitting at home, watching a movie, whatever, but they're basically just recording that information in a two-week trial and then they'll determine whether or not that trial's been successful and then potentially rolled out across more parks in Singapore with more spot the dogs. And again, just that information to say how many people are there, not who is actually there. Yeah, I, I reckon it's time that we rise up for the puppy dogs. There needs to be a union for the working dog because they're copping the poor raw end of the stick right now. And come on, where are you hippie tree huggers? Need to get together and start the working dog union movement. It might be. we all need to look out. It there you go. Be. Look, I, 
I've come up with the thing. <laughs> it might be the thin edge of the wedge, Andrew. It might be that today, Spot the Robot's taking over from some dogs. Tomorrow, who knows, Spot the Robot might be taking over our jobs. So maybe it's a good yeah. time to start the rising now. Yeah, absolutely. I knew there was a there was a reason why I didn't like Spot the Dog because my sister, when she was a kid, used to watch Spot the Dog all the time. Ah, there you Hated go. With a passion. Damn you, Spot the Dog! You're bringing back too many childhood memories. Now. <laughs> <laughs> this is hurting too much. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Uh, enough of, uh, talking about Spot. Uh, Microsoft. Uh, what are they up to? Well, Microsoft had an incident back in about 1997 where one of their employees sent out an email to a distribution list. He made the simple but silly mistake of including all 25,000 people on that distribution list in the two box rather than in the BCC box or using a, another way to, to send the email. So mm. that ended up generating 15 million email messages and chewed up 195 gigs of data because someone out of those 25,000 replied to all and gave their answer and someone else said reply to all, hey, take me off this mailing list. Another person said reply to all, what are these messages about? Before you knew yep. it, the 25,000 generated 15 million. So Microsoft took some steps all those years ago to say, let's work out a way to actually stop or limit to a certain extent the number of people that you can have in that list. But they've now gone a step further and, and they've got this, this ability or introduced this ability to block an email storm because if you get a certain number of emails going out over a certain time frame, it basically locks it down for an hour, so you can't send an email for an hour. And then if it happens again, it, then it blocks your email outlook, for example, for four hours from sending email. The idea is, as much as you can say to people, don't click reply to all, and people, oh, I know not to click reply to all, but sometimes people still do it. I still see it occasionally. Mm -hmm. So the idea is Microsoft's trying to put enough steps in place, enough safeguards in place, that if someone does do the reply to all, it starts to actually slow down the process so you don't get this email storm created, which can literally shut down email systems around the world. That one I talked about back in 97, shut down Microsoft's email servers. Yeah, and, and it also put the old Hotmail uh, and the Outlook emails, you gave them a really bad rap because then all of a sudden, I remember I was working at a company and they sat there and, and used to say to me, if anyone replies to you with a Hotmail, you're not going to get their email because we've just blocked them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Everyone just... It's like, how do I communicate with this person? And, and they're immediately suspicious as soon as it's a Hotmail or Gmail because you can you can have a thousand email addresses that are Gmail addresses. People often create those when they're starting to create a scam or some whole bunch of spam that wants to go out. So often people associate those with scammers or spammers, so they often block those by default. So I always say to people, if, if you're serious about business, make sure you've got your own domain name rather than just a Gmail address. Yeah, I know. L lucky I've still got my old Yahoo that I can get around all that, Matt. I've, just, I've still got access to my old, that was my first ever email, yahoo.com.au. Yeah, right, that's going back a few years. I know, right? <laughs> I know. It's, um, yeah, so um, there you go. Uh, Apple, they've reopened some retail stores around the country. A lot of people would be excited about that. Yeah, last Thursday they opened those up. There's 22 retail stores around Australia. 21 of those have been opened. The main one in George Street, and I was down in Sydney a couple of months ago, and before they were starting to be closed down, that was already closed for renovation, so that is still closed at the moment. But it was back in March that they shut down all 458 of their retail stores around the world, which was all the ones outside China. They left the ones in China open because they'd been closed previously, so they'd actually reopened those. And so now yeah. they're reopening. But it'd be a different experience for people because... If you ever went into an Apple store, you always found it was fairly crowded. There were a lot of people around. If there was a popular product, there'd be lots of people gathered around that, having a play with it. There might be a, an Apple genius, in inverted commas there, to sit there and show people how to use it. And, of course, people would gather around that. But, of course, now they'll be enforcing social distancing in the actual stores. They'll make sure they're spread out enough. They'll have limits on how many people can go in the store. So it won't be the same buzz in an Apple store for the time being, but at least they'll be open again, and so people will be able to go in and actually physically see products before they buy them. Yeah, and a lot of people used to hang around there because obviously they had the dedicated charging spots, but they also had free Wi-Fi. It was, and there'd be everyone going there for the free internet. You'd always see out the front of the, any Apple store, there'd always be five or ten backpackers sitting on the ground that you could, you could kind of work out the only yeah. reason they were there was they had their phones out, catching up with some email, whatever, with free Wi-Fi. But it was a clever move from Apple because the cost of that free internet for those people was minimal. 
And they came there to actually obviously use it and take advantage of the free Wi-Fi. But while they're there, sometimes, who knows, they might have bought a, an accessory, they might have bought a new phone, but they were hanging around there. And it's all about foot traffic. And if you get enough foot traffic, you'll sell some product. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Tracking technology, it's aiming to uh, improve online learning for students. And uh, a lot of parents are kind of glad that some kids have gone back to school already. I know. I know. My in-laws are with, uh, my sister-in-law lives with them and they're happy that my kids have gone back. <laughs> well, I always feel for, for you, Andrew, for people in your position, and mm. look, I've, I've done radio for a number of years and, and I've walked into studios for 10 minutes and walked out again, but I think of the actual radio announcer and all day you're sitting in the studio, you're talking, and you don't know for sure if someone's actually listening to you right at that moment in time. You might just be talking to a void. And teachers mm. and university professors are finding this at the moment, that they're speaking, and sure, they can look at Zoom and they can see some little thumbnails that maybe they've got some people there, but are they actually engaged? Are they interested in what they're saying? They don't really know for sure. So there's some really clever research going on now because there is so much content being created effectively where there's researchers that are basically tracking students' eyes, their head, their mouth movements, their keyboard movements, and they're putting all that together to basically get an engagement level. And then they're feeding all that information back. Say they've got a Zoom meeting with 30 kids in a class. They're feeding all that information back. And the, the person giving the actual lesson gets a little chart or a little graph on, on his screen that shows the engagement level. So if he's talking about something that gets a bit boring, the 17th digit of pi or whatever it might be, that, that people are a little bit disengaged with, he can see real live on the screen the engagement level dropping. So he knows he needs to change it up a little bit. If he's delivering some content and that engagement level is showing high, and again, this is real-time data, he knows that what he's delivering right now is interesting to the, to the students, so continue on down that same path. So really clever. I mean, I'd love to see something the same for radio announcers, having this feedback mechanism in all the cars and houses out there feeding back to show how interested people are in what you're saying. I don't know how you do it, but it'd be fantastic to have it. Oh, in America, they've already got PPM meters that uh, measure your listening and... Uh, in real-time data and all that kind of stuff. It is around, hasn't been adopted in, in Australia yet, but you know what, Matt? If I can't get my wife to listen to anything that I say, heaven forbid I can get any bloody radio listener to listen to anything I have to say. Well, <laughs> so, on that what? basis, I, I should give up radio because I, I have no hope of getting my wife to listen to me. Oh, geez, I should have given up, right? <laughs> I should have given up years ago. <laughs> I sit there and I say, you know, I, I have the ultimate face for radio, but I even I sit there and sometimes and go, I still don't know how someone put me on the radio with a voice like this. It used to be even worse. <laughs> but I have tapes to prove it, but no one will ever hear those tapes. So <laughs> we're kind of safe there. Uh, Google, they're putting an end to the phones. Apparently they were going to build a smart city. Yeah, look, I, I'm really disappointed in this. I actually look forward to going over to... It, it, it was a, a component of Toronto. So I was part of Toronto, call it a city, mm. but it was really just going to be a suburb of Toronto. And I've actually got a brother over in Canada and I, I read about this sort of concept for a few years now and I thought, I can hardly wait till they get it up and going. That'll give me an excuse to go over, see my brother and have a look at this mm. smart city. They dedicated 12 acres of Toronto to basically say, let's build a technology city, an internet city, from the ground up so that rather than go and retrofit a city, the same as it's a bit of a pain to retrofit a house, go and retrofit yeah. an entire city is a fair bit of work. But if you start from the ground up, if you build it knowing that all the technology you can possibly find is going to be there and be available, then what a fantastic city you could build. So your autonomous cars know exactly where they're going to be driving because you're building that technology in there. You're, you're building in uh, tower, or not so much towers, but, but community living areas and workplaces that are easy to get between and they're controlled by a technology that the temperature is controlled by a technology even one of the ones i loved was they have heated cycleways a plan for heated cycleways so you can still ride to work and still be warm even though the temperature obviously gets very cold in toronto you can have all these air sensors around to see how the air is you can collect rubbish automatically a whole range of things which i think would be incredibly exciting but because of covid19 they basically said the the economic uh, viability of this city just doesn't stack up at the moment. So they basically, they've said they've cancelled it. I believe we'll see something come up like this again in the future. But for the moment, this particular smart city has been canned. Yeah, because they've been investing some stuff and all sorts of stuff. I know in Perth, they were looking at doing some uh, autonomous buses around the city. 
Yeah, and that that's that's the sort of thing where, where where there's no driver in there. There's some retrofitting <laughs> that's going on and some ideas that are being implemented in cities a bit ad hoc. So you'll see buses in one city, for example, or you'll see where they might monitor the air in another city and how can we make it easy for people to get to work. So they're doing little bits and pieces all over the place. But the idea of this was let's build this concept from the ground up, mm. which I just, I love that idea. And it, it is, if you build your house from the ground up with smart technology, it's always going to be better than trying to retrofit it afterwards. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at the metro in Sydney. <laughs> is, is there a metro <laughs> that, in that's Sydney? A, <laughs> that, that's a prime example. Dri- driverless train, they tried to retrofit something into a city and they've only just kind of sort of got it right. I've only just gotten used to that. It freaks me out though. Every time I go into the Metro in Sydney, I use the Metro in Sydney. Right. I, I keep flushing back to the Simpsons and the monorail episode. <laughs> There's the song of monorail, 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 monorail. Yeah, monorail, monorail. <laughs> and, and I just keep waiting for it to just keep going round and round and kind of at high speed and someone's not going to be able to kind of stop it because there's no giant donut in Sydney. So <laughs> I don't know where they're going to latch the anchor from, but... <laughs> no, no, I don't know. <laughs> That's good that Simpsons still gives you nightmares when you're on public transport. Yeah, I know, right? Because considering they've proved so many things right over the years, it's very scary. <laughs> but yeah, no, now that I've said it, it'll probably happen, then they'll right. go, it's your fault. It's your fault. <laughs> now, this might explain why my parcel a couple of weeks ago may have gotten lost in the system and was telling me for three days that uh, it was stuck in Penrith. Apparently, Toll Group suffered a ransomware attack. Yeah, and unfortunately, this is their second ransomware attack this year. So ransomware, for listeners that may not be aware, ransomware basically is similar to a virus where you'll receive something on your computer system that's infecting your computer system. And it may be Mm. that it locks down your files. It may be that it just makes your whole system inoperable. And then you receive a message. And the message says, you've had your system shut down. You need to pay me X dollars and we'll open it back up for you. Now, home users get hit with these sort of ransomware attacks as well. And they might ask for $100 to unlock the files on your computer because they figure that a home user is probably not going to have a few million dollars spare cash sitting around to unlock the beautiful photos of their kids. But they might give up $100. But for large companies like Toll, they figure the cost of their IT system being shut down just for one day runs into millions of dollars. So they figure that some of these large organisations may be willing to pay tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to basically open up those systems again. Now, Toll got hit a few months ago. They said they refused to basically pay ransom, which is the right approach because... I'm not sure about you, Andrew, but I'm not sure how much I'd trust someone who was attacking me in this way and I pay them the money. Are they really going to unlock it or are they going to say, I need more money tomorrow or we didn't never hear from them again? So Mm. not paying the ransom, I think, is the right approach. But it actually emphasises for everyone, for home users, for major organisations, having security in place as much as possible, but also having offline backup. So in a case like this, if you do get hit by an attack, even though you might have all this great security in place, if they manage to get past all of that, then at least you can say, well, we've lost one day, we'll go back to yesterday's backup, or we've lost an hour, we'll go back to an hour ago backup, but at least you've got some way of going back there. So for Toll, their their logistics processes are changing at the moment. They'll be doing some manual things, so your parcel will arrive. I I assume it's probably already arrived now, but it certainly put a delay across a number of processes there and a number of organisations across the nation use Toll. They'll learn from this. They've had two attacks. They'll learn. They'll get better at this. But it's also a warning, really, to everyone else. Every individual, every organisation, security and backup. I can't emphasise those two enough. Yeah, I had to make the phone call, Matt. Yeah, the yeah the phone call you hate to make, where you sit there and go, "I've been tracking my parcel for the last three days. It's been stuck in Sydney. I haven't received it. You're now seven days late. Um, can you tell me where it is?" And they went, "Ah." Oh, Yes, we'll mark it for next day delivery. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you will. Sure enough, next day it did show up. Oh, good, good. So yeah. I'm, I am grateful that I actually did get my parcel. And uh, morning to any toll drivers that uh, might be listening around Mudgy today. I really appreciate the fact that I got my, my parcel. But um, I was actually working at a radio station late one night, and um, I had two computers in my studio. Matt. One was a Mac and one was a PC. And I actually did have a ransomware message actually pop up on the screen. Wow. And the IT guys, we did have IT guys at this radio station I worked at, and the technician had already gone home. And, uh, and it freaked, freaked me the bejesus out, the fact that like, all of a sudden it's, you know, the machine's locked and I had to bring a 1-800 number, and I went, oh, my gosh. And I don't recommend this to anyone, 
but I kind of got lucky because I did the old, I hit the power button on the machine, turned it off, turned it back on, it came back up. <laughs> so, so, so whichever African warlords were trying to bug my machine and get money out of me didn't get anything because it wasn't a very good ransomware attack because I had to bypass it. It was probably, and there are some pretty basic ones, it was probably just a message that popped up and nothing had actually yeah. been encrypted on your PC. So you've done well. We'll call you yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the ransom beta from now on, Andrew. There you go. That's that's me, champion of the ransomware. <laughs> <laughs> you expect calls from all over the nation now. Any ransomware attacks go straight to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the old IT crowd joke. Have you turned it off and back on that's again? Right. Yeah. So so you travel from from Mudgy to wherever across the nation, and you walk in, you turn it off, turn it back on. I didn't yeah. fix it. Sorry, that's the extent of my my work. That's it. Two hundred bucks. Thanks for coming. I'll uh, I'll see you next month. Thank <laughs> you. It's my job done.